Um, Mr. Bernard, I'm going to start with you. As an industry leader, um, would the time the govern and, and, and the government expenses and resources they've already expended on um, gun control have garnered a greater result if it were focused on illegal firearms? And what would you recommend they should focus on? And how do they do that, uh, given your opening remarks? Well, I, I, I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Maltz. I think that uh, the first thing we have to do is start getting young people out of gangs. That's a, that's a huge thing right there. And it needs to be done, and it needs to have a real concentrated effort. I'm not talking about putting in basketball courts. I'm talking about doing stuff to make people not want to be in gangs. And, and part of the plan that we had given this government was to do precisely that. And like I said, we never even got a response. So you're talking similar to uh, my friend Marcel Wilson's one-on-one -on -one movement out of Toronto, which is doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, and, okay. and Mr. Wilson's program is absolutely knock it out of the park. It's really good. So you had mentioned uh, a couple of things, and I, you know, you've been around uh, this industry for many, many years, decades, and um, I know. I, I mean, I've worked with my colleague across the way, Ms. Damoff, for years on this before I was on this committee, and. I know she's well-intended, and I know the government is well-intended, but we have divisions not only on this issue but other issues. But we have divisions in this country on this issue, and I believe it's because people don't understand the current laws we have, and they work. And but, but, but what, from your perspective, why do we have the great division on we have this huge need for gun control, and yet there's the op people who are equally as passionate and, and believe the evidence that's before them, too, that says we don't need the gun control, we need gun control, but not what's being proposed. What do you say to that? Well, I, I think that there's a number of factors in play. For, first of all is media. Uh, ev everything that most people learn about firearms comes from either a Hollywood movie or watching the CBC. And quite frankly, neither one of them is very accurate. Um, you know, Firearms ownership in Canada is a huge step. It takes months to, be, to get a firearms license. And of course right now with the Firearms Centre being backed up for at least eight or nine months on the services that we actually pay for, um, we, we are not even seeing that. People can't get courses, there's no availability. And so we're, we're trying to get people safe here. The, all the safety things, Every safety measure that has been legitimate and actually saved lives came from our community. It didn't come from an airy-fairy world of, geez, maybe we'll try this. We know what to do with this. That's why our safety record is as impeccable as it is. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Tony. I, I really appreciate uh, the, the perspective on that. You had mentioned earlier that um, crime guns uh, seized by police um, you know, and examined by N. West and others, um, have shown that the majority of crime guns, and I'm going to I'm going to mention Toronto because that's where we have as many homicides as there is anywhere uh, related to gun uh, to gun crime and gangs. Uh, I've heard as high as nine out of ten of those firearms are uh, crime guns used in the commission of an offense are smuggled in from the United States. You mentioned rail. What, what else? What can we do? We're, we're talking. We're actually trying to make a difference here on smuggled firearms, and I think we all agree that's our number one issue. How do we deal with that appropriately? I, I think there's been a lot of great efforts made on this already that that get more money into the hands of CBSA. But of course, you know, every time somebody does something preventative, the, the crooks think up a new way to, to beat it. So you have to always stay in front of them all the time. And there simply isn't enough money. There simply isn't enough. And I realize that there's government announcements coming out saying, we put X number of extra hundred million into CBSA to find guns this year. But if you look really carefully, they also took it out someplace else. Exactly. The, the, the point I guess you can make to that is if we would take, rather than the money that's going to be from the uh, from the confiscation of firearms under uh, the OIC from May 2020, um, th that two or three billion dollars is a minimum. The cost is going to be plus this cost could be put toward effective dealing uh, with smuggled firearms. The other issue, and I think I only have a, a, li a limited time left, breaching of bail conditions on pro prohibition orders already. 660 some offenders with over 1,500 offenses and firearms offenses. 
the revolving door of justice. This is what aggravates Canadians. This is why they lack trust in the justice system, have lost trust in governments who don't fix the loophole in the revolving door. How do we fix that? Well, there's a number of ways to fix it, and, and, and the, the system that we had proposed before is one of the ways to do it. But the biggest problem, a, as we see it, is there's not enough jail spaces. So what happens unless somebody's committed a murder, they slap them with a firearms prohibition and out they go. And we've got one guy that we've actually found that's had 17 consecutive firearms prohibition and never done a day in jail because there's nowhere to put them. So what you got to do is, is give some teeth to that firearms prohibition order. And, and I'd be happy to work with any member to deal with this because this is a chronic problem that needs to be dealt with and we have a solution.